Okay, now we're all set to understand the mathematical thinking behind Galileo's work. Remember, he was trying to understand the motion of objects as they fall due to, due to the influence of gravity and gravity alone. Now, dropping things off towers is too hard, they fall too quickly, it's hard to measure anything, so he's looking at things rolling down ramps that slow things down and the motion is still due to gravity. So he's getting data like the following. Here's my made up data from before, but he was noticing if he worked out heights at regular time intervals, so everything has this nice regularity to it, they notice that the data has not constant first differences but does give constant second differences which means oh we're in the situation we've been doing for the last lecture playing with sequences the constant double differences we know most likely comes from some combination of standard leading diagonals what combination well if you look at this okay I've got some number here some number here some number here if I kept going with the difference table I get zeros thereafter so I've got a leading diagonal that has non-zero 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 and it'll be zeros thereafter so, if I'm looking for a combination of standard leading diagonals, I'm probably going to use the ones that have probably non-zero things in the three first, the first three places, but anything with non-zero after the first three places won't be needed. For example, I won't be needing n cubes. Non-zero, 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 and still non-zero. Don't need it. N to the fourth, a non-zero, 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 and non-zero. Don't need it. You won't need anything higher. So it looks like the form is coming from some combination of the diagonals from 1, from n, and from n squared. Which means it's given it does. It's probably going to be given by a formula, some combination of n, 1, n, and n squared, a quadratic formula. Now, of course, this data here is not about n, it's actually about time, so I'll just say the same thing in terms of the variable t rather than variable n, but Galileo deduced that, oh, constant double differences means we've got a form that's composed of some combination of t squareds, n squareds, plus some combination of t's, n's, plus some combination of 1's. So he said the height of a falling object must be given by a quadratic formula like that. Because he looked at double differences and saw they were constant, and voila, that implies we've got a quadratic formula possibly going on. Wow, that's brilliant, that is fabulous. So that means that if I throw a ball up into the air, it goes up and down over time, that height's changing by a formula like that. And if I give this ball a little bit of horizontal motion as I throw it, as like I'll throw it like this way, or you can have it like a tennis shooting machine, what do you call that thing? I'll throw the ball, you'll see the heights change this way as the motion moves uh, constant to the right. Nice horizontal uh, fixed motion that way. But what you're seeing is the arc of a quadratic curve. That curve. Brilliant. So yes, under ideal circumstances, when gravity is always pointing directly downwards, so I guess we're assuming it's a flat Earth, motion of, uh, of projectiles is, is indeed quadratic. Brilliant! But what I love about this, it shows a general technique to test other U-shaped graphs. Because after all, the question is, are all U-shaped graphs quadratic? Now we know what to do. We can look at a U-shaped graph, collect some natural data from it, as long as it's done in a sort of regular interval way, and look for constant double differences. If we don't see constant double differences, it's not going to be quadratic. Alright, so let's give an example. So let me clean the board. So here is an example of a curve that kind of looks U-shaped, but we know it's not quadratic. So here's a pot lid. If I look at the bottom half of this pot lid, where's, where's, what color should I do? I'll do it in blue. I will draw the bottom half. So there is definitely a U-shaped graph. Great. Um, that we know it's not quadratic, because actually, at the side of the pot, I know those lines want to be vertical, and we've already seen quadratic graphs do not have vertical side lines. They're not actually U-shaped, technically. However, let's pretend I've got that. And I see that, I come across this, and say, oh, wow, it's a U-shaped graph. Could it be quadratic? Well, how would I test? Well, like I said, let's collect some data for it at regular intervals. What I'm going to do by that is I'll draw a reference line on the bottom. Here's a reference line on the bottom. Great. And I'll mark off regular intervals according to my ruler, trying to be neat. Great, so there's some regular intervals. And what I can do is then collect data that represents the height. I can do the height there, get one data value. Get the height there, get another data value. Get the height there, another data value, and so on. So I'll do this for four, five, six, seven, and eight. Ooh. So I'll have eight data values. Now I'm not actually measuring them right now, but what I could do in principle is then, okay, Eight data values at regular intervals. Look at the difference table. Work out the differences. Da, 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 da. Work out the differences again. And if this is quadratic, that means if it's composed of these leading diagonals, you should have non-zero, 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 zeros thereafter. I should have a leading diagonal that's nothing but non-zero, non-zero, zeros thereafter. I should be seeing constant double differences. 
And I bet if you actually tried this and measured as best you can, even within human error, you will not see constant double differences. That will be telling you this U-shaped graph is not actually quadratic. Whoa, whoa, which is grand. In fact, you're seeing U-shaped graphs all over the place. Like, do this one. I mentioned it earlier on, I think the very first lecture. Here's a hanging chain. People for a long time throughout history wondered what shape is that? This could be quadratic, it looks pretty good. So I'm going to invite you to test, hang up a piece of string or a chain on a, on a board somewhere, draw a bottom reference line, collect data at regular intervals, and see if you're getting constant double differences. Is a hanging chain given by a quadratic formula? Wow. In fact, I need to point out one thing. There's a third example I want to do today because textbooks assume it's obvious that what I'm about to show you now is quadratic, but it's actually a deep question. So scholars way back in Greece, ancient times, loved geometry and they created all sorts of interesting curves based on geometric properties. And one very famous one was the following. They said, just take a point and they called it F focus. Draw any line you like. I'll draw it horizontally just to be nice to myself. Okay, horizontal line. And there's a line L. And they actually gave it a fancy Greek name, directrix. And they said, consider all the points, any point in the plane, such as distance from the focus, just draw the line from it to the focus, and the distance to the line goes straight down to the line, turn out to match. So let me see if I can do that fairly well. That looks like about, I think that point, that distance there is about the same as that distance there. That equals that. So there's one point. I can do it again. In fact, I can do the middle point right here. I can see if I do the middle point here, I can get that distance to match that distance. All right, so there's another point on this curve. In fact, if I keep collecting all the points, you'll find you get a curve that looks like this, a U-shaped graph. And they called it a parabola. All right, so the question is, is a parabola actually quadratic? All right, but actually I'll tell you why the Greeks actually really love this curve. This curve, they realize, has lots of amazing geometric properties and this talk of Archimedes way back something like 2,200 years ago actually wanting to use parabolas, parabolic mirrors, to help thwart off uh, invading enemies. So he was on the island of Syracuse, so here's a, the cliffs of the island, here's the beach, uh, here's the water, the ocean, so they're coming up to the island of Syracuse and often enemy ships would come up now, this is back in ancient times, so everything's wooden, so here's a ship. You can't see it. my pen's running out. Whoops, let's draw a better ship. Let's draw a ship in yellow. Is my pen still working? All right, so here's a wooden ship coming to attack the island of Syracuse. And what Archimedes suggested doing, oh, parabolic mirrors. We know the geometry of parabolic mirrors. That is an amazing property that if you build a big mirror on the cliff face and hang it just there, that they had the property that it would take the parallel rays of light from the sun, so the sun is so far away that it's essentially parallel, so all the rays, and you can use the parabolic mirror to actually focus parallel rays to a single point. Now it's not the point that was the focus of the parabola, but it actually turns out to be another focus point. So you can take all the hot rays of sun from the sun, from the, from all the rays from the sun, and focus them on the hull of the ship, and the ship would then start to go into flames and burst into flames and they thwarted off the enemy. So the Greeks actually loved parabolic mirrors. Now again, it's one of these things, there's no evidence that Archimedes actually built these things, but the Greeks knew all about the geometry of these wonderful geometric curves. So they created things called the ellipse, the circle obviously, um, hyperbolas and the parabolas. Now my question is, is a parabola a quadratic curve? Well, we have a means to do that now. So you can actually draw one by trying to measure distances, but actually there's a really cool way to construct a parabola out of grease, uh, tracing paper or greaseproof paper. So where did my parabola go? I have a parabola somewhere around here. Here it is. I, you probably can't see this. I don't think this shows up well on the camera. But what I've done here is I've got a piece of paper that shows crease marks very well. I've got a focus. Can you see that dot there? I drew it in the middle of the paper. And I'm using the bottom edge as my directrix. And if you just take your bottom edge and bring it up to the focus. So if one part of the one spot on the bottom edge touches the focus and make a crease mark, you'll get, well, a crease mark. And do this lots and lots of times, lots and lots of times, lots of times. And then you'll start to see a curve come out. That is the parabola. Now, I've proven the notes below this video that actually this folding technique does give the distance property you want. So you can actually see this really is a parabola. But the question I want to say, because a lot of textbooks just say, this parabola is quadratic. They just say it. 
But is it true? Well, now you know how to test. What you could do is actually mark off regular intervals on the bottom line. So get your ruler, mark off regular intervals, duh, 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 duh. measure the distance up to this folded curve, and check the data. Does it give you constant double differences? If the answer is no, it's not a quadratic. If the answer is yes, then it looks like the mathematics is showing yes, it is quadratic. Fabulous, absolutely fabulous stuff. All right, so there we go. So we've got ways now to test whether U-shaped curves, curves actually are quadratic and it's actually a lot of fun. And we start looking around, you'll start seeing all sorts of U-shaped graphs. I mean, the, the famous archway to the west in St. Louis, Missouri, it looks like an upside down U-shaped graph. Is that quadratic? I don't know. Find a photograph of the, the archway of St. Louis and then collect some data on it. Draw up regular heights, see if it has constant double differences. Do this for all sorts of wonderful things. What wonderful joy this is. Great stuff. And you've got to love the power of playing with double differences in sequences. But of course, all that's about trusting patterns. And I promised last lecture what, what, what you could do if you decide that you don't believe in patterns. So let's talk about that for sure next lecture. See you then.